Hi, Nick. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so I help run uh, Passive. Passive is innovative portfolio management software that pairs directly to your brokerage account, allows you to set a target portfolio, and allows you to rebalance into that target portfolio with one click. Uh, before Passive, I worked in fundamental equity research for my entire career. So I was doing deep dives on individual companies and I also am a software developer, so I was writing code that kind of helped support our investment research activities. So that's kind of a little bit about me in a nutshell, and I'm happy to dive more into any of those specific topics if that's helpful. Sure, sure. Let's let's dig in. All right. So just in terms of passive, I think the easiest way to understand really what it is that we do is to understand the problem that we're trying to solve for investors. So uh, the original prototype of passive was built by one of our, our co-founders, Brennan Wood, to solve real problems that he was encountering when he was trying to manage his own investment accounts. Brennan was trying to manage his own retirement account. He was trying to manage his wife's retirement account. And he was also trying to manage two education savings accounts for his kids. So to kind of help keep all of this organized, Brennan kept a spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, he would put in his holdings and his contributions over time. And the spreadsheet would calculate what he needed to buy or sell to get invested into the allocations that he wanted. So uh, every one of those four accounts that I mentioned had a different target allocation. And that's just because different risk tolerances and time horizons associated with each account. So one example might be that his kid's education savings account had a shorter time horizon than his retirement account did. So uh, he had less risky assets in that account. So all of this kind of spreadsheet work that Brendan was doing, it did the trick. It did allow him to manage his portfolio, but it was very tedious. It was very time consuming. And Brendan knew as a software developer that there was an opportunity here for him to build something that made it easier. So the original prototype of Passive eliminated the manual data entry requirements. It pulled information directly from his brokerage account did the rebalancing calculations and told him what he needed to buy or sell to get invested in his target portfolio. Today, we've evolved way beyond that. We allow you to actually trade your account from the passive platform. And we believe it's one of the best places for you to kind of manage your own DIY investments for the long run. I agree. And I think uh, finance people, they focus and actually keep focusing on Excel spreadsheets. And I, I don't, I don't think, I don't see this thing coming off, uh, Pretty soon, I think people will still, uh, still keep going back to Excel spreadsheets and it would make sense to have the, the whole thing online. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so Excel is like a super powerful tool. It's very customizable. You can really build a lot of really amazing things with Excel. But one of the downsides to it is that it's not really an integrated tool to get financial data from different places. So that's kind of where Passive shines over Excel is that it actually integrates with your brokerage account and allows you to make trades. And, and I agree. And I think it is important for people to start steering away from having like a bunch of uh, books and then using a, an online tool. Regarding, regarding your, your past, did you start off just uh, uh, equity research? You started directly as a computer guy. What, uh, tell us a, a bit more about your past. Yeah, so uh, I guess my journey in the financial markets really started when I was in college. So when I went to college, I enrolled originally in a biology degree because my dad was a medical doctor and I thought that might be like something that I wanted to pursue eventually. Now, it turns out after a couple months of studying plant biology and animal path pathophysiology that it turns out that that stuff really was not that interesting to me. So I went to my academic advisor and I said, what can I switch into that will allow me to still graduate in four years because I don't want to spend any extra time studying here at the university if I don't have to. So she asked if I had uh, ever considered doing a, a degree in mathematics. And so that's what I ended up switching into. And it turns out that a lot of the good uh, summer internships and summer jobs for math majors are in accounting and finance and those sorts of fields. So that's what I ended up going into for my first summer job after the transition. Now, when I did, uh, when I did get transitioned into kind of that summer job, it was a really cool opportunity because my first summer job after switching into math was at TD Mutual Fund. So that's like a large mutual fund provider here in Canada. And in the same office, in the same building, we had different people doing all sorts of different investing strategies. Now, in one corner, that may have been fundamental equities. In another corner, it may have been fixed income. In another corner, it may have been something more exotic, like synthetics or derivatives. And that was really cool because there was a real culture of mentorship in that firm. So I could go around and ask people questions about their investment strategies, the pros and cons, the implementations of each one. So that was really an excellent introduction to the financial markets. And I've been hooked ever since. After college, I took a job as a fundamental equity research analyst at an investment research firm called Sure Dividend in Houston, Texas. And when I was there, this is kind of when I started to become more interested in software development and building tools rather than building a research platform. Because it turns out a lot of what that job was, was kind of updating models periodically, updating spreadsheets. And it was really seemed to me at the time, had a big opportunity for me to automate it. So 
I started learning how to code Python at that time and really got hooked on software development. So now kind of my long-term game plan is to operate at the intersection of finance and software development for the rest of my career with any luck. Yeah, and it makes a good fit, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's lots of stuff in the financial world that is periodic in nature, easily automatable. And uh, I think there's a really big opportunity for good software developers who also know a bit about finance to kind of make a niche for themselves in the world today. And I think, and also shifting the, the, our conversation here regarding the way that we approach things as, as an algorithm, meaning when you're picking stocks, when you're choosing and uh, analyzing an investments, run, run us through a little bit regarding machine learning and the, the whole idea so that it can be useful for the next, uh, the next company that is going to focus on just picking the, the right investments to make. Yeah, so machine learning is basically like using computers to make good predictions. That's machine learning in a nutshell. Machine learning relies on large data sets. So one of the reasons why machine learning hasn't been like really widely adopted in the world of investing today is that we don't really have that much good financial data. We only have good data on stock prices probably back to the 1970s. And we probably only have good data on fundamental business activities like earnings and sales and those sorts of things probably until like the 1990s. So that's just not a really long data set of, of financial data to train a machine learning model on. And that's why it hasn't really been, uh, you know, widely used. Now, the what, what's, I guess, more interesting is how people are using machine learning to predict the, the more fundamental activities of a business. So there's all of these data sets on, on anonymized credit card activities and website traffic and those sorts of things that you can purchase in certain places on the internet. And those data sets are much larger, much more suited to train machine learning models on. So what we've seen is companies like Renaissance Technologies and all these larger kind of algorithmic trading or quantitative finance shots using alternative data sets combined with sophisticated machine learning models to make better investment decisions and hopefully improve the returns for the firms and for their investors. Yeah, and uh, we see, we've seen also that, well, there's a little... It's kind of a discussion around it because it's that glorified front running, what's happening on Wall Street regarding the machine algorithms competing with each other. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I, I think, are you talking about the whole, uh, the, the GameStop situation? Not, not, not the GameStop. What I, what I, not, obviously, that's one case of the Reddit thing. I'm talking about uh, glorified front running in, in, in respect to the way that Wall Street is set up so that it can keep liquidity on a market. So there's people when oh, they are- Oh, so like, yeah, the, the, role of, the role of market makers. Yeah, I mean, so market makers are basically firms that will kind of attempt to narrow bid ask spreads by buying it cheaper and selling it to you higher. So people look at that and they don't like it because it seems like the market makers are profiting off kind of everyday investors. But um, I'm not super familiar with that space just to be perfectly candid. But in my opinion, based on my understanding of how it works, I think market makers really, Kind of do serve a purpose in the sense that they inject a lot of liquidity into the marketplace and make the markets more efficient that way so you, you may you know pay a couple pennies here and there on your bid ask spread as a result of that but your orders will get filled more quickly and and it just kind of provides more liquidity to, to market participants all around and p picking up on what what you said uh, i'd like to hear your perspective on gamestop and <laughs> future situations like that that's obviously they're going to come yeah, I mean, the GameStop situation is pretty unprecedented. I haven't really seen too, too much in, in the history of the financial markets that's really similar to that. So I'll give, I guess, the audience for anyone who's unfamiliar a bit of background. So there's a, wall, uh, a community on Reddit, a subreddit called Wall Street Bets. And GameStop is one of the most heavily shorted, or it was one of the most heavily shorted stocks in the stock market. So what that means is that if uh, a bunch of wealthy investors, hedge funds, and, and kind of billion dollar investment funds had made bets such that if GameStop declined in price, then those hedge funds would profit. So it goes down and their money, they make money. Now, one of the downsides to a short position like that is that due to the mechanics of how short positions are structured, if a lot of investors start buying that stock and driving the stock up, the short sellers can be forced to kind of sell, which causes the price to go even further higher. And that's called a short squeeze. So a bunch of uh, investors who were reading in this Reddit sub community called Wall Street Bets kind of coordinated a a intentional short squeeze where they all decided to buy GameStop stock at the same time to create a short squeeze. And I think GameStop stock went from something like $2 a share to $350 a share. And many, you know, wealthy investment funds who were short this stock lost billions of dollars. I've seen rumors of different funds going bankrupt and those sorts of things. So it's been a pretty interesting situation and something that I think a lot of investors have taken you know, notice of. In terms of my personal views on it, I don't really think that 
Like I have no personal view on GameStop stock. I will never touch that as long as the situation is happening with my personal money, just because it's a bit outside my personal risk tolerance. But uh, it's an interesting situation. It's pretty unprecedented. And I think for anyone who's kind of interested in the financial markets and stock market investing in general, it's, it's just a, a really fascinating situation. Another fascinating, fascinating history is regarding Bitcoin. Because it's like, uh, it, at least for me, it's like, it doesn't make sense for me regarding an investment because there's no underlying asset. It's just a digital perception of things. I'd like to hear your, your perspective on, on this topic. I think the idea behind Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general is pretty interesting, like a decentralized currency that's not associated with the government and that can't be inflated. I think there's like a lot of merits to the, to the concept. I think that Bitcoin as a currency based on everything I've read, I'm not sure that it will ever get widespread adoption. To my understanding, the Bitcoin like transaction network is pretty slow and it just can't really like handle the payment volume that it would receive if it really did become mainstream. So that's kind of a concern of mine. I also think that there's like a couple, uh, really low hanging fruit in terms of how the Bitcoin transaction and cryptocurrencies in general could be improved, like in terms of the user experience. So right now it's still pretty hard to buy and transact in cryptocurrencies. And I also think that sending cryptocurrencies to people is pretty hard. You have to know like their Bitcoin wallet address. And that's just like a very long alphanumeric string. It's hard to remember. So I think we'll go through a couple different evolutions, similar to kind of what the internet went through. So in the early days of the internet, if you wanted to go to a website, you actually had to know that website's IP address. And now we have the domain name system. So you can go to google.com and just go right to it instead of having to know the IP address. So I think we'll get some kind of a readable, understandable mapping of like words to Bitcoin wallet addresses so you can transact with people more easily and a couple other kind of improvements like that. But we'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Regarding changing topics regarding the programming languages that you provide as, a, as in the means of a, of a course to people, Why, why do you think Python is a way to go for people, for people that are just learning about it? And why do you think they need to focus on the specific uh, uh, programming language if they want to get their skill set higher in the finance world? So Python for finance is an excellent uh, kind of combination because a lot of the packages that are most popular for financial applications are available in Python. So there's like a library called Pandas, which is like a portmanteau of panel data. So that's a great library for working with tabular data in Python, similar to like working in Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, except you're doing it in a Python script. There's another library called NumPy, which is a portmanteau for numerical Python. It's a numerical computing library that allows you to kind of execute numerical operations really quickly in Python. So lots of the common applications in the financial world are available through Uh, open source Python libraries, which is excellent. Passive as a platform is actually built primarily, like our backend is, is built on Python and Django, which is a web framework for Python. So we're really familiar with Python and Passive. It's really a good fit for people who want to do a little bit of computer programming in the financial world. And I think it, you know, it's only growing in popularity and the ecosystem continues to evolve every year. So that's kind of my 30,000 foot overview of why we like Python. And the, there's, is there an age, age range of people that are looking forward to, to learning about your, your product? Uh, at Passive, I mean, a lot of our users are kind of like in the accumulation stage of their investment lifetime. So I would say people who are like 20, 30, 40, 50, and kind of trying to get their investment set up so that they can have a safe and comfortable retirement. Gotcha. And they, do, do they usually have like, they fall in the same type of... Um characteristics of the, the client that you're looking for or are you finding yourself sometimes some surprises of people that you weren't expecting to become a customer? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely super excited about kind of helping anyone take their DIY investing into their own hands. A lot of our users tend to be like educated, curious professionals, like software developers, lawyers, doctors, those kinds of people who they have some money to invest, but they're not exactly, uh, you know, they don't have enough free time to really handhold their portfolio all the time. So they need a like passive to help them automate their wealth management if that makes sense yeah and regarding strong points of, of the platform what would be some that would like to to share with the audience yeah so just in terms of like the overall mission our goal at passive is to help you save time and save money with managing your own investments some of our key features would be the ability to uh, rebalance your portfolio with one click so that one click trade functionality is like a really a core value proposition of what we do and then a few others would be Uh, our reporting feature. So we have a reporting dashboard that allows you to see in detail the performance of your investment. So that, that's great. We also have 
um, the ability to connect to multiple brokerages. So if you have some of your investments at TD Ameritrade and some of your other investments at Interactive Brokers, Passive can provide you one centralized dashboard for you to manage all of your investments in one place. So that's great as well. Just out of curiosity, for the future, where do you see yourself and your company heading forward? We want Passive to be integrated with all of the major brokerages around the world. So we'd like to be a, become kind of a major player in the global financial system that helps everyone around the world manage their own investments. And uh, so for us, a key component of that is just getting, getting integrated with more brokerages. We're always looking to integrate with more brokerages, add more support to people, get access to more user base. And that's kind of a, a big priority for us moving forward. Okay, this is, this is part of the, the podcast, but I usually ask this because I'm a voracious, voracious reader. Run us through some of your favorite books from this year. From this year, okay. So I just finished uh, the Elon Musk biography, which is a kind of interesting timing because I started reading it before he was named the richest man in the world. And then I was about halfway through when that announcement was made. And uh, in that book, it's by Ashley Vance. Uh, Ashley actually predicts in the book that he might become the richest man in the world one day. So that was kind of interesting. That book overall is just like, super inspiring to see how hard he was willing to work to achieve his goals. So if you're ever feeling lazy, pick up that book and you will see an example of a man who's probably willing to work 10 times harder than you are. At least that was true for me. So it kind of gave me a kick in the pants to work a little harder, which is good. Um, another book, and this was not a read of this year, but it was a read, I guess, of, of uh, late last year. I read a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And the subtitle of that book is uh, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracting World. So I find with smartphones and the internet and email, it's like very easy to get distracted from work that's really, really important. So that book kind of got me back on a better track of ignoring the distractions, setting some dedicated time away each day to really focus on like my big project for that day. And uh, obviously that book was pr pretty influential for me because of that. I, I agree. I think it's, it's super important. Uh, it's focused by an elimination, getting rid of stuff that doesn't matter and just focus on the one thing that uh, will make you move forward. And on, exactly. that, and on that token, where can people find you if they want to get a hold of you? Yeah. So if you're, uh, if you're interested in learning more about our investing platform, our website is passive.com. That's P-A-S-S-I-V.com. There's no E on the end of passive. You can also, uh, if you have specific questions or if you'd like a demo of the software, you can send me a direct email at nick.mccullum at passive.com. Nick, thank you for joining us today. We'll speak soon. All right. Thanks so much.